This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. From the greatest generation to the millennials, just how different are we? Generational expert Cam Marston on this edition of Conversations. Cam Marston is an authority on baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials. Demographic descriptions we've all heard. Other than the chronological age, how different are these generations? It's Marston's mission to tell us. As an author, speaker, and consultant, Marston explains how the merging of these generations are disrupting the workplace and the marketplace. He's authored several books on the subject, including Motivating the What's In It For Me Workforce, Generational Selling Tactics That Work, and Generational Insights. He has consulted some of the biggest names in business, among them American Express, Nestle, Coca-Cola, and ESPN. We welcome Cam Marston to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Delighted, delighted, thank Fascinating you. Fascinating subject that you study. How did you get into doing this? It's, a, it's not a linear path by any means. I look back on it and it makes sense, but in the moment it did not. I had a small research company in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was living. I did a lot of focus groups and exit surveys for my clients. And I began to notice that the feedback, the motivations of the people for the decisions they were making to leave their company, uh, the reasons they chose to work someplace, were beginning to become a little bit different than what I had heard in the past. And I kind of would assemble these things in my head. And if you can imagine a, a bookshelf full of three ring binders full of the research. And I began to collect these kind of anomalies and I put them together and I went to an HR group, mm -hmm. a human resources group that meets in Charlotte on a monthly basis and said, I've got some really funky trends going on here. You guys may be interested in this. And they said, well, we'll slate you for a luncheon. Come tell us. And I did. And I gave that presentation at that luncheon and they came to me and said, you know, that is exactly what's going on in our workplace. Can you come talk to my management about that? And my reaction, which was quite, you know, I look back on it with kind of sheepish grin, my reaction was, you know, I'm trying to generate some research work here. And they said, well, what if we were to pay you to give that presentation? I went, oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then sure. So today, 20 years later, I continue to do the research. I've got a team that I pull together to help me with each of the projects. And I take the content and I bring it to the clients based on the need they have or where their pain is. What were some of those early trends that you saw that made you kind of take notice of this? At the time, it was when Generation X mm -hmm. had first kind of developed some traction in the workplace. They hadn't been there long, but their attitudes were becoming known. And their attitude was, I'm not loyal to the employer. I'm mm -hmm. unloyal to my, my, myself and what I want to do. I, I work to live. I don't live to work. I work to live. I define myself by who I am outside of the workplace versus who I am inside of the workplace. And these were contradictory to the baby boomer work ethic, to mm -hmm. the baby boomer ethos that had laid the path from that, uh, up until that time. So those were the things that said something, something different is going on here. There's a, there's a subtle rebellion. It's not an in your face, it's not a fist of cuffs, but there's a subtle rebellion in attitude. And that's what began to reveal itself that I brought to that, that HR meeting that day. What do you think caused that? Uh, a disloyalty. The, the Xers felt that the employers they've seen in the past, their parents' employers, perhaps were disloyal. Or that the Xers saw that their parents worked very hard. And in the end, they said, what, what was it all worth? Right. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy your job? You've worked for X many years. You've missed every football game and every... Christmas pageant that I've ever been in, is that what I want for myself? So they took the, um, the inherent offer of employer-employee and began to reject it to say, I'm not sure that's what I want. Is it just me or is that attitude even more prevalent with the millennial generation? I think it's found, it found footing with Generation Xer and it continues to grow. And it's certainly a reflection of our society today where individual fulfillment, it's much more important than company loyalty or employee loyalty or bring, being a good employee. It doesn't mean that there aren't those out there, right. but we're seeking a different type of fulfillment from our work today than we ever have in the past. Historically, it was, I give my loyalty to my employer, they pay me, and with that pay, I, I develop a life. Right. Today, it's, I give my loyalty to my employer if I enjoy it and if I'm getting something good out of it. It's not just pay, 
but am I enjoying this time I'm spending together? Is it fulfilling me? It's a whole new different ball game than it was historically. Yeah, and it also seems, and just reading some of your research and some of your articles, it seems like particularly the millennial generation wants to work at a place that makes a difference in society. Is that Undoubtedly, uh, a very altruistic generation, a big desire to give back. And the employers who know how to recruit well are featuring that, are going out saying, we need good people. Let's not talk about our pay plan, or our insurance plan, all of which will become important, but what we do for our customers and what we do outside of serving our customers for the society. They put that out front. Here's who we are, here's how we fulfill our customers' lives, and here's incidentally what we do outside of that to better the community. And the millennials show up. I want to be a part of this group here. Interesting. Yeah. Let me get you to kind of go through the various groups. So we've got, uh, you mentioned the Gen Xers, we mentioned the millennials, and then you've got, I, I think, the matures, right? And then the World War II generation. So explain what all that means. We'll go oldest to youngest. And I call them the matures. Uh, they're, they're actually, I collect a couple generations in one and call them the matures. You've got the World War II generation, also known as the GIs, also known as the greatest generation. Immediately following them is called the silent generation. They were children during the Second World War. They weren't of the age to fight, but they were alive. Their conflict is Vietnam. That's, mm. I'm sorry, their conflict is the Korean conflict. Right. And that's, uh, I put them under the banner of matures. Behaviors in the workplace and in the marketplace, very similar. Uh, the, the experiences that shaped them, somewhat different. There's a difference in being shot at in World War II and, and the, the experience that shaped them somewhat different, but workplace and marketplace, which is my focus, very similar. Following that is the baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. Following that is the Generation Xers, 1965 to 1979. And following that is the millennials, 1980 to 2000. And the prediction is the next generation begins around the year 2000 and will go for, they typically run 18 to 22 years. So. We'll see exactly. It's a measurement of hindsight to figure out where the generation begins and ends. You see it in population rises and falls. You see it in attitudinal things. I'm calling them the iGen, the gen younger than the millennials. iPad, iPod, iPhone, iMac, iGen. That's mm -hmm. certainly a reflection of my own kids' interests these days anyway. So those are the four, the five, the four that are most prevalent in the workplace and the marketplace are the matures, the boomers, the Xers, and the millennials. The millennials have most recently become the most populous generation in the workplace. And uh, the iGen will be another big generation, but at the oldest stages of 18, 16, something like that, okay. uh, we don't know a lot about them just yet. So the millennials, the biggest population in the workforce right now. Correct. But people are living longer, people are working longer. How is all of this converging? It's converging, there's a couple of ways. It's a, it's a fantastic question. We'll start again with the oldest to youngest. Right now, the baby boom generation has more mortgage debt at their age than any generation previous. And there are many reasons why, why but you look at them and say, they, we've never seen a generation this old with this much mortgage debt. The implication or the, the reaction, they're continuing in the workplace longer than generations have historically in order to manage that debt, to pay it down so that they can position themselves to retire. They're staying around the workplace longer. The Generation Xers, I'm a member of this generation, are growing frustrated seeing the baby boomers not stepping aside to allow the Xer into a position of leadership or seniority. Historically, at the Generation Xers' ages, they had positions of leadership and seniority, but they are now having to wait much longer due to the baby boomers not able to retire. So they're growing frustrated. They're getting in what is becoming known as the mid-career doldrums. The next opportunity for me is yet a long way away. I can very clearly see it, the Xers say. So I've got to figure out something to get myself stimulated. I was at an event earlier this week talking with four guys. we all standing in a circle. Three of them had recently changed jobs due to boredom and the realization that there's no opportunity for them due to the baby boomer in front of them. So the Xers are going through a flux, a transition, trying to remain stimulated in their work. The millennial generation is in a career building stage. They haven't been in the workplace long enough to have become bored with what they do right now. But the unique thing about the millennials, and they're such the apple of the eye of the media today, the point that I find most interesting about them that makes them a fascinating study is this phase of life that they began called what I call adultolescence, the combination of both adolescence and adulthood. Every stage of life that every generation has gone through 
that symbolizes a transition of one stage to the next, getting married, having children, having a mortgage, buying a home. The millennials are going into in much older ages. They're remaining younger longer. They're going through these stages of life later, and it's showing up in career direction as well. So it's taking longer for them to pick a career versus a job. Whereas the baby boomer could say to the millennial in their workplace, when I was your age, I had done this, I was married, I had children, I had a mortgage. You're 25 years old, you're 30 years old. You don't even really know what you want to do yet. Right. It's this lag. It's often referred to as failure to launch, but it's remaining younger, longer, which means in their career, which was your original question a while ago, I realize that, in their career, they're just getting traction. Whereas generations before them had, had really had traction already and had a destination in mind. So they're delaying that traction in their career. And that's got to be a challenge for the marketplace as far as people selling houses and mortgages and things of that nature, right? Beyond, it, it, it's the frustration. It's the eager, uh, the marketplace is dying for the millennial generation to start buying homes. You buy homes, you buy paint, you buy gardening supplies, you buy fertilizer for your yard, you buy pets, you buy pet supplies. It's a trigger purchase and so many things happen with buying homes. Uh, life insurance. When are you going to start buying life insurance? Well, when I have children, when I have commitments beyond myself. That's a lag. It's a big lag. So there's so many different industries like that that are watching this generation saying, hurry up. Our business is made on these transitions. Hurry up, please. Hurry up so right. we can sell you something. Well, that would sort of explain why we're in such a, one of the reasons anyway, that we're in such a slow growth economy. Huh? I think there, there are many reasons. That's, I think that could be one of them as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, another one that, that came to my attention a couple weeks ago with a client up in Montreal is the sharing economy yeah. that the millennial generation has become quite fond of. In truth, every generation has adopted a component of it, but the millennials have really embraced it. They're a boat manufacturer. They so actually they're an outboard motor manufacturer, and they thought we have relied on generations using a boat and a and a motor as a status symbol of accomplishment. What if they only want to share? What if we can't count on this massive generation of 90 million people to want to own a boat, but instead share boats? I mean, <laughs> what is our future if they don't want to own boats? And I thought, oh my. I hadn't thought of that, but you're in trouble if that's the case. I don't know what your solution is, but you're in trouble. It's fascinating. Well, and, and, and there's been a lot of discussion around that with, with uh, you know, like the Uber and things of that nature, that, and particularly in large metropolitan areas where the millennials aren't buying cars, right? I don't need a car. I got a cell phone, and, and, they're, and they're everywhere, <laughs> yeah. and they're cheaper yeah. than owning a car. Yeah, I think it's a, the sharing economy was once thought as kind of a, you know, California, Silicon Valley, they, they seem to grasp it, but now they're like, people across the nation are going, ooh, yeah. this might sting. Yeah. we got to re-gear on this. <laughs> and, and, and on top of that, one of the things that I have noticed just uh, from an anecdotal perspective is, is I know when I turned 16, I was down getting my driver's license. That day, I was ready to go. Kids doesn't seem to be a big deal to them. Not as much. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And uh, it's not anecdotal. It's, there's, there's evidence behind it. Not, not a certain... The demand for independence that you and I sought, which first step was car, right. second step was leaving home, right. is not as strong in this generation, due largely, and this is my theory, to a, a, a remarkable relationship between the millennial generation and their parents. It's a tighter, closer, more akin to a friendship than any two generations we've seen before. So when you have this... I look back and I adore my parents, wonderful people, love them to death, but we were never friends when I was in my teens. There was kind of a, there was a push, there was a tension between them, and that car was my escape hatch. Uh, and so many people were, were this the same way. When you're friends, when there's less of the tension, when there's a, there, there's a, a relationship beyond parent and child between the two of you, then the desire to escape is less, less strong and one of the manifestations is it is, yeah, I'll get my driver's license someday. There's really no hurry. Right. Well, I guess that would explain why so many of the millennials are comfortable coming back living with their parents. There's no taboo anymore. It's right. not a shameful thing. When I was uh, trying to get attraction in the workplace, if I failed and had to move home, there's kind of a, a black mark by your name. What's wrong with him? Mm -hmm. Certainly my parents' generation was that way. Why, why do they keep moving back home? What's wrong with this child? Why, are they unemployable? Not so much today. What's the toughest generation to figure out? 
Well, the millennials right now are undergoing this dramatic change. We still have many of them in their teens, and the oldest ones are in their early to mid-30s. So that's a lot of transition in there. They're going through the teens, through the adultolescence that I'm talking about, to the early to mid-30s where there's career, career traction. So there is a transition in them right now, which I'm finding to be a little bit, you know, to talk about the millennials is such a wide range of life stages right now that it can be a challenge. Um, the baby boomers are, they're the apple of the eye of the nostalgia gig. Mm -hmm. When the public television wants to raise money, they put uh, you know, a, a, a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young concert on. They put James Taylor on. Right, right. You, you know if you're flipping through and you see something like that, oh, they're raising money. The boomers are all crying and reaching for their wallets. Right. That's what they do. <laughs> um, but the, the Xers in there, um, they're kind of a skeptic. They're kind of an antagonist. They're kind of a, they have a little bit of a, I, I define it as a chip on their shoulder, an itch that they can't scratch. And I struggle to understand exactly what the source of that is. I have some theories. And whether it'll ever change, you know, whether, whether they'll ever uh, let go of this exceedingly pragmatic attitude, this skeptical attitude. I, I, I watch, I, I measure the pulse, I measure the temperature, and it hadn't changed, which leads me to believe it probably won't. Yeah. I'm still unclear of, uh, of, of what the end result of that is. Yeah. So the Gen Xers, of which you're one, I'm one, we're a smaller group than the baby boomers or the uh, millennials, correct? That's correct, yes. How, how much smaller? Boomers are in the, it depends on where you put the beginning and ending of years of each generation, but the boomers are in the 75, 80 million range. Millennials are at 93, I saw this recently, 93. The Xers are in the 50 million. Okay. There are, if you think of a, a population chart, they're a trough in the chart. Okay, interesting. What about the World War II generation, the, the matures as you talk about? What, what you know, because we, we talked about earlier, that we're all living longer. So has the dynamic changed with them in today's modern world where, where everyone's living longer than, than what it that ordinarily would have been? I think there's, a, there's an awareness of this, uh, the people in this generation. I've got a, a, a grandmother, 94 years old, glorious woman, uh, of being alive longer and having a, a sense of, of, I don't know if history is the right word, but perspective that is very unique to, to humankind. I mean, it's not, in the Old Testament, they lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. We don't know how they measured the years, of course, right. but to, be, to have so many people with so much history under their belt, to have seen so much, it's a very unique perspective to have, in my opinion, ever. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a desire to share it, to say, listen, we've been through this before, or here's what I've learned, or something like that. But we're all, they're often, they struggle to find an audience. We like to cherish this generation. Right. I'm not sure we like to listen to them as much as we should. What do you think that is? Uh, we're a society of new. We're a society of flashy. We're a society of, of trends and uh, whatever's beeping and flashing in front of us. And that perspective they offer, while has great value, doesn't seem sexy to our society today. It, it, we, we can, you and I can look at each other and say, man, that's some great value in that right now, but I don't, I don't know that we would line up to hear it at the same time. How do you think technology has changed the makeup of the generations? Uh, one we know, and this comes from my research in, uh, in business environments, is empathy, an ability of two people to talk, to kind of read body language, understand what you're feeling, and I can address that in my conversation with you and know how to speak to you has been delayed, has been stymied in the younger generations, including the iGen, the millennials and the iGen, due to technology, particularly handheld technology, which is the primary source of communication for so many of the youth today. And I use it a lot myself. Sure. Uh, but the ability to empathize has been stymied. It has not been eliminated. It has been stymied because when I, when I primarily communicate like this, or like this, or whatever it may be. I, 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 it takes too long the ability to look at you and know what you're thinking and feeling based on your facial expression and your body language doesn't come until the mid, mid, sometimes mid to late 20s, whereas historically it had been late teens that we had understood empathy. Technology has stymied our ability to communicate in that regard. And what kind of effects do you think that's going to have in the, in the marketplace? Trying to sell to someone of this generation, of the millennial generation, can be tough because they're the salesperson, if they're a primary talker, 
you know, we, we want to look at each other or we want to write fluid sentences in an email are going to struggle, feel like they're not being taken seriously. Or they're going to come away, as I hear so often, what's wrong with kids these days? Right. They could at least treat me. They don't have to buy from me, but they can treat me politely. Right. And my bet is this, under, this, this other individual is completely unaware of the way they've made you feel yeah. due to the delay of the ability to empathize. Interesting. One of the terms we hear a lot is helicopter parents. Yes. Yeah, what, are, what are helicopter parents? Helicopter parents came as a result of 9-11. 9-11 caused the baby boomer parents to really want to focus and shelter their children. It made them cocoon. That was a term that came out of 9-11. And it made them helicopter to hover to be very protective, uh, enhance the child's learning experience, enhance the child's development, and you know, just like the term would suggest, hover right over them. Uh, helicopter parents are the reasons that colleges and universities today have orientations for parents. My parents never went to my orientation when I went to college. There was no such thing. Right. But the helicopter parent demanded it. We want to know what goes on at the school. We want an orientation for parents. And the interesting reaction to helicopter parents, a lot of these generational characteristics are reaction to what came before. The reaction to the Generation Xer parent, to the baby boomer helicopter parent is, I'm not gonna do that. Right. The term that many of the Xers have adopted is a free range child. I'm gonna raise a free range child. I'm not, <laughs> gonna, I'm not gonna let them go wander aimlessly and forever, but I'm gonna let them go a little bit more. I'm not gonna helicopter over them. I'm gonna give them a bike and I'm gonna give them boundaries and say, move freely within these boundaries. Um, and the, the, the extra parent is not the helicopter parent, they've become what is known as the drone parent. Drone parent. They orbit, they circle high above, they watch through the apps on their phone, they know where their children are, but they're not gonna get involved unless they absolutely have to. And buddy, when they do, it's shock and awe. It's explosions <laughs> and people wondering what just happened here. So they, they hold back until they have to strike. And when they strike, people know. <laughs> what about the speaking of, of parents and, and kids and, and things of that nature? What about the whole concept of like in sports, for example, coming up where where so many of the teams, you know, everybody gets a trophy or you know everybody gets the championship or everybody wins or you, you know where I'm going with that. So, uh, so what's what's the story with that? There's a I, again, it comes out of it comes out of the baby boom generation, and, and there's a lot of. There's a lot of pointed talk at the millennials about that. But I think the people that are talking need to realize those millennials didn't choose to get the trophy. Someone handed them that trophy. Someone ordered the trophies. Someone organized the parents and said, let's make all sure all the children get a trophy. That's not the millennials. That's the parents. If you want to uh, react, react to the parents. What it was, the baby boomers are a very competitive generation. They were raised in sometimes in a, in a time of scarcity, and particularly the older boomers. And they didn't want their children to not feel like a winner. So they came up with these consolation prizes, these uh, participant trophies, these everybody gets a trophy type of thing. And what it's led to is a generation that's used to be acknowledged, yeah. that regardless of performance, regardless of success or failure, is used to be acknowledged for participating and it shows up in the workplace today. Boss, I'm here, you know, let's, you know, I'm here. Yeah, isn't this great? I'm <laughs> Pat here. me on the back for coming in. That's right, yeah. it's, it's 8.10, I'm only 10 minutes late, <laughs> man, I'm catching on. And, and I, I hear employers that are, you know, beside themselves. My people come in and wanna be acknowledged for being at work. This comes from a baby boomer who's at, who was at the same part in their career, that baby boomer was said, was told by their boss, if you do a good job, I might know your name by the end of the year. Yeah. And now the, the, the pendulum is swung the opposite way of, I'm here, I'm here, let's acknowledge me. How are employers going to balance that? Some are really taking the bit in their, ma in their teeth and saying, we've got to figure this out. This is a generation of 93 million people. They will be our predominant customers soon if they're not already. They will also be our predominant employees. We've got to figure this out. So they're doing things, and we see this in Silicon Valley a lot. There are often a lot of what I call trinkets in the workplace to entice people to both come to work and want to work there. Nap rooms and ping pong tables, and a lot of the technology companies are doing this type of thing to make work fun. Let's right. make it fun. Let's acknowledge you and make it fun for you so that you want to be here. But some of the research we've done recently is somewhat heartening in this regard, and that is once people turn, the millennials are focused right now, turn about 30 to 32, 33 years old, the traditional motivations of work 
start rising to the surface. Mm -hmm. It's no longer celebrate me because I'm here. It's I really get fulfillment when I contribute to the success of the team. Old school stuff. Mm -hmm. I get fulfillment from being welcome and a part of this group here. The greatest award I get is when my peers confer an award, award on me or recognition on me. Old school stuff, which occurs on the other side of adult adolescence. You just got to wait it out. So some of these organizations are taking the bit in their teeth and saying, we're going to figure this out. Others are saying, and I had one not long ago, I'm not going to hire anybody under 30. I'm going to let someone else train them how to work, and I'll get them on the other side of adult adolescence. Interesting, interesting. I'm getting um, short on time here. Tell me just real quick, like uh, generational selling tactics that work is one of your books. What, what, what am I going to learn from this? You're going to learn tactics and uh, ideas on connecting with each different generation of consumer. It rain, the book is perfect for anything from services to products. It's very widely written on understanding their buying motivations. Okay, very good. And on generational insights. Tactics, best practices that I found in workplaces after 20 years in the business. People that have genius ideas, I've interviewed them and put them in that book on how to retain and motivate people in their workplace. Okay, you've got several other books too, so what, what should we look for? We have one focusing exclusively on financial services called the Gen Savvy Financial Advisor. We got one on how to train millennials, a downloadable ebook, very simple to read. Go to Amazon, enter my name, you'll see everything. Okay, very good. And of course, you're consulting and flying all over the all over the country, huh? Yes, yes, and, I and am. Continuing to study the fascinating generations. Always something new. Yeah, absolutely great. What an interesting conversation. I I enjoy talking about it. I really do. It shows. It shows. So your website, people can, I know you blog on there so they can kind of keep up with what your thoughts are and, and that kind of stuff. So it's definitely worth uh, worth taking a look at it. Cam Marson, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. What a real pleasure. Uh, we always hear so much in the media about what's going on with the various generations. It's nice to get some uh, real insight and uh, understand the, the nuts and bolts of it all. By the way, Cam's website is generationalinsights.com. He blogs on there and uh, has all kinds of interesting information. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also flying around YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.